Thank you, and Mitch. First one up from our guy Fonz. He put a couple in here. He was panicking before the show, but he seems to have calmed. So, Fonzie, ask Mikey and Mitch, how many series can we lose uh, LSU tough. being and still host uh, a regional? Uh, I don't think it's serious. I think it's games. Um, series is. I think a good rule of thumb is you have 30 conference games. 15 and 15 is usually a host. I think in the number usually around like 17, 18. That's to win the, the, like a national seed. But if you want to host a regional, 15 and 15 can get a host. Especially being, a, I would imagine, as you're a defending national champion. And like LSU, the Alex like, Box, like doesn't mean you're going to be a national seed, but a 15 and 15 in the SEC on a good conference, I think they get a host. Now, I'd like to see them go 17 and 13. You know, like 18 and 12 will put them kind of in a position maybe to win the conference, get close to the top. 18 and 12 would definitely give them a national seed. 17, 13, maybe 15 and 15, I think, would give them a, a host. Yeah, I would say you got to get to 15 plus. I think 15 plus in this league, especially here, gives you a like a real shot to do something. Um, a little bit of that, and I'm not saying it has to be an unbeaten streak, though, but you put yourself now in a point where you kind of got to get hot and kind of got to start going on a little bit of a run. Yeah. You gotta, you're gonna have to steal some series on the road. You're gonna have to beat it, and this is one of them, right? You, this is a big no one. No one's gonna expect them after these two weekends to go in and take this series. Yeah. That would be a monumental win, and something that gets them back on the right track if they're able to go into Arkansas, steal that series, and kind of come out of this thing with with a little steam going. Yeah, because you're playing at A and M too. Yeah, and so that's gonna be another tough one, right? But. And, and and also because you just don't, like, let's just say, literally, if we just look at the next two weekends, you got Arkansas, you got Vanderbilt. Nobody's expecting six wins. So you're going to have to, you're going to have to have a four and two streak. You're going to have to go five and one. You're going to have to find a way to get some momentum going if you want to stay on track. Right. And look, 15 and 15, <clears throat> if you want to be a host at 15 and 15, you want to be playing your best baseball towards the end of the year. I think that the, that the schedule is set up for that. So I think that if they, if they get to that, I think they'll host a regional. Now, Super is a whole different conversation, but I think host a regional, that would be a good spot for right now. You could look up at the end of the next weekend and be like, okay, let's, our, our goals have changed. Super regional is right in our sights. Next one up, Nick Hessler asks, asking him what lineup changes does Jay have to make midseason like Maneri did that would scream championship year? I think you could just take that in context of what lineup changes do you see yeah. that could possibly go first? cause a change. I, I, dude, I said it from the start. Like I said, I thought Thatcher was a guy that if that team wanted to be at its best last year, he was going to have to pitch well. If this team wants to be at its best this year, Paxton Kling has to turn it around. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. The kid's too talented. He's too much of a talent for them to go out there and not have him on the field and or not be playing anywhere near his best and think that they're going to be their best version of this team. I think he's got to get going, and he's got to get going quick. Yeah, I agree. I think that um, like the changes in the lineup, you have got to have somebody at the bottom of the lineup that continues to flip the lineup to the top, right, and get on base and kind of set the table for the guys that you want to drive them in. Listen, he's moved Tommy to the two hole, right? Like, which I, I don't, I like that. But if you have Tommy in the two hole, you need the guy hitting eight nine to be able to get on base for Tommy to drive him in. And, um, you know, that that would be a change. I don't know the answer to that right now. Like like you said, Paxton Kling is a huge key to this. Him playing really well. Some of these freshmen that are starting to get some opportunities. And Larson, who somebody needs to step up to be that guy in the back end of the lineup to get on base and set the table for the guys ahead of him. Because here's the deal, and we've talked about this all year. Tommy White's not going to be able to get to where Tommy White needs to be if people continue to pitch around him. And you get pitched around when you have the ability to just put him on base. And I know that Jared Jones has 10 home runs, and he looks great. But they're not going They're going to continue to try to get him out until Jared Jones proves that you, I'm so hot right now, you can't get me out. But they're not going to give Tommy – they're not going to let Tommy beat them. Now, if there's consistently guys on base when Tommy's hitting – that puts a lot more pressure on the on the defense to say, all right, well, are we going to put him on base and take our chances with the guys behind him, with the bases loaded, runners in scoring position, or we're going to put him in base on base and take our chances with a guy behind him with a guy with Tommy on first, who's probably not going to score from first on a double. So, 
you've got to figure out how to flip the lineup and get guys in scoring position for the guys that you want to drive guys in. Now, I don't know who that is. I don't know who you put in. Um, but you've got to make the, you've got to figure out figure that out. Yeah. Yep. Okay, in that same vein, next one up from Stanley Reed. Stanley Reed asks, ask Mikey Mitch, if you're Paxton Kling, how do you fix it? I know this dude's a dog because everybody, I mean, you see the talent, but his question is, how do you fix him? Because I don't think there's any bones about what people are seeing. If I knew, if I, like I had a magic bullet, I'd be the richest man in the world because I could give every hitter a magic bullet. Now, <laughs> do I think that there's some things that, if Paxton watches his video, he's like, damn, okay, I this is not what I'm trying to do. I think a lot of it's mental. I think a lot of it is him trying to feel for the baseball. I've been there a lot of times. We all get You've there. You've been there. We all get there. You know, like, I've been there. I, I, I'm not trashing. I'm not saying anything bad because I, I understand it. I have been through the exact same thing where at this point you're trying to compete and you're trying to get on base and you're trying to get hits and you're feeling for it because – you're not super confident or you don't have a good feel for where you're at. I get I get it. But there's got to be, like, if he watches this video, he's going to realize, okay, I'm not in a position where I can really attack how, the way I want to attack. It feels like I'm feeling for it. Uh, he's got to take a step back and say, okay, what do I need to do mentally to put myself, myself in a mindset to say, okay, I'm going to be able to get off my A swing as much as I can. I don't care if I get out. I just got to know that my swing feels good. And listen, sometimes it only takes one or two swings, one or two really good days in the cage, and you get to the field, and you're like, okay, there's the, there's the feel, and you kind of repeat that. And that's easier said than done. I get that. I get it. But, um, you know, he's just going to have to continue working working to put himself in a position mentally to where he can physically do what he's trying to do. I So doing this is what I love about doing something like this because I don't here's – what, here's what I really, really feel. If I'm going to talk about something, I can be critical of an action without being, I won't say critical, but without feeling like I'm talking bad about the person, right? When I watch him play right now, I'm not saying that's who he is. If that's who he is, he wouldn't have been the prospect he was. If that's who he is, LSU wouldn't have recruited him the way he was. When I watch him play right now, I see tentative, tentativeness. I see someone, I won't say scared, but I see someone apprehensive to actually let it the hell go to actually get out there and just ball. And I think that becomes a decision at some point because you can feel, 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 feel until you finally say, you know what, bro, just swing it. It's almost a fucking mentality. Yeah, it really, you get there where you just, hey, swing it because what else can happen? It can't go any worse than what it has, so let's go do it. Let me give you an example, right? I don't, I, I, Paxton's all. I'm not. I don't want to. The only way we're I can, not talking about, it, but we can criticize right. what we see right now. Right, and the right? only way I can ref- reference this right is. 2021, my last year playing, I was in AAA, and my whole thing was I need to get to the big leagues. I need to get back to the big leagues. I just That's all I wanted to do. I was the oldest guy in the locker room, and I knew I was a big leaguer. I just wanted to get back. And we're playing at Norfolk, Virginia. Worst place in the world to play. Field sucks. Paul doesn't carry. Cages are terrible. It's hot and muggy. Stinky. It's just not a great <laughs> – the clubhouse is brutal. The club E <laughs> is the worst. Like, just nothing's Absolutely. good about it. Right? Like – Stale bread, years. moldy bread, like nothing good. No. So I'm in the cage, and it's hot in the summer, and I'm grinding through it. And Chris Johnson was our hitting coach, and me and him had a great relationship. Mm-hmm. And I was so far in my own head because I didn't feel good, but I wanted to feel perfect. That was my issue. I always wanted to feel perfect. I wanted to feel good in the cage, and I didn't. I wasn't barreling stuff up, and I was yelling. I was dripping sweat. I got My hands were almost calloused. And... I wasn't starting that day, right? I was off, and so I was just doing extra work. And I was yelling at Chris Johnson, not at him, but yelling at me basically to him. So you're yelling at him. And I was like, you know what? It's just lack of fucking talent. I'm just not fucking good. <laughs> like, that's where I was mentally, that. right? That's just where I was at mentally. And so everybody starts laughing. I was like, don't fucking laugh. I'm being serious. I just fucking suck, right? Like, <laughs> so it's over. I pick up the balls. I go in the clubhouse. I take a shower. I'm like, all right, at least I'm not playing today. What do you think happens? Guy gets hurt. I have to go in the game in the seventh inning against a guy throwing 98 mile an hour sinkers. I don't know where I'm at. I can't, I have no idea how I'm supposed to feel at the plate. First at bat, guy throws me a 98 mile an hour sinker, hit a ball, 110 right up the middle for a base hit. I'm not even happy. I was like, I don't even know how I did that. Like, that was just lucky swing. But I was like, at that point, I was like, I feel so bad. I don't know where I'm at. Screw it. I'm just going to swing. 
and it worked out. Next at bat, guy throws another 98 mile hour fastball on side, hit the ball over the scoreboard for a home run. Run around, everybody's giving me high fives. I thought you sucked last night because I don't even know what I did. That's bullshit. I don't even know what happened. I don't know how I did that. I can't repeat it. But my point in saying that is it's sometimes you get to the point where you say, hey, listen, I'm an athlete. Fuck it. I'm just going to swing and just see what happens and just let it happen. And that's what happened. And that's just an example. I'm sure you have plenty of examples Bro, that I, same we way. We all have. Like, you play the game long enough, we all go through the shit stages. It just is what it is. But usually when you go through the shit stages, you go through the figuring it out stage right after where you're trying so hard to nitpick everything. And guess what? It shit still ain't working. And then you finally get to a point where you're like, man, to hell with this. I know I feel good. I've felt this. I've done this. All right. So now you start trying to play faster. Mm-hmm. And when you start trying to play faster and you stop worrying about this field, that field, this field, and you start playing the game with your eyes, everything starts to sink and work at game speed. And when I watch him play right now, he ain't playing at game speed. He's swinging through pitches that are way off the plate. He's taking pitches right down the middle. He's not playing the game with his eyes right now. And guess what? I'm not sitting here saying that I've never done that. We've all done it. But I can only talk about it this way because I've been there, right? Now it takes you to say at one point, sooner or later, it can't get any worse, bro. Go play at full speed. Mm -hmm. And then things start to finally catch up when you do it. But don't get yourself in a, in a spot to where you're no longer allowed that opportunity. That's where you don't want to be. I think that was a pretty good answer. Agreed. Send it to him. Okay, next one up. Fonsarelli. This is subjective. Ask him to him. Oh, well, let me send it. Ask him to him. Full send. Full send. Why is the plate, why is the plate approach with Arnold's scoring position so bad? Because I do believe that is something that you could point to and be. It's no, it's not. Whole... It's not. I'll just answer it this way. You go. No, it, I'm saying for but I just watched the two games with 25 dudes that I are know, watching on Friday. Let and me, that's it. Let me answer it very, very, very simple. Very, very, very. There's been two weeks in SEC play. There's been six games. There's this thing called the law of large numbers. We ain't hit that thing yet. So let's not be too overcritical of what you've seen. Because you never really asked those questions in the in before we got to SEC play. And here's my... <clears throat> To, to expound on that. You go through this weekend, you you go 12 for 17 with runners in score position. You score 15 runs, right? Now, all of a sudden, as a team, you're hitting 350 with runners in score position, right? That's, that's the law of big numbers. That's what he's saying. The other thing is, when people are in scoring position, pitchers are pitching better, right? You're no longer... Getting the, hey, I'm just going to get ahead of this guy. I mean, don't walk him. Don't get anybody on base. You are getting, hey, I can't let this guy score. I'm going to throw my nasty stuff. I'm going to break uh, throw breaking balls a little bit more, a little bit sharper, a little bit harder. I'm going to lock it in, right? Now, the hitters have to lock it in, too. But it's it's not that easy to hit with the runners. Now, it's a big deal. You yeah, need to to win. It is. But the law of big numbers, right? Like it's gonna, it's gonna fluctuate. It's gonna change. It just sucks that it started the way it started. Um, as far as approach, I don't think that the approach necessarily is wrong or is bad. I think that right now they're just in a position where nobody is really hot, and that and that and the guys that are hot aren't really getting a ton of opportunities with guys in scoring position. And you gotta think too. Like I said, one weekend ago was their first SEC series, and then you go weekend number two, and it's your second SEC series. There is a when you approach these kind of things, you have to be very, very, very delicate in the sense that when you make too big of a deal of it early, when you jump on the panic button early, it brings the wrong kind of quote unquote urgency to these, to the players, to the hitters, to where they actually do get tighter in those situations, right? You actually have to let large numbers play out and be a thing before you make this huge scene or huge idea of, Hey, y'all suck in this situation. Let's figure it out. So, you got to be very delicate about how you think about that two weeks in the play. Yep. Next one up, Nick Hessler. Send it. Ask him, could Jake Brown be the next Mikey Matic? Oh, nice. Glazing. And save our season in center field as a true freshman. Wow. One. Thank you. I did not save any season. Save y'all. <laughs> yeah. The save y'all. Uh, one, I did not save any season. I was just fortunate enough to be a part of that team. Right, that definitely was not the case. 
Nick, um, I see what you're doing. I love it. Uh, I like it. I two. Like it. Two. <laughs> two. Text me. Put that one in there. Put that one in there. I was a righty, and now I left you. No. My point is, Jake Brown, Jake Brown is very talented, right? Jake Brown is going to do both at LSU. He's going to pitch and hit. This year, he's going to hit. He's a freshman, though, right? And he's going to have some opportunities. I talked to his dad at, at our tailgate this past weekend, and his dad's like, look, Jake Brown wants to be at LSU. He loves being at LSU, and he's going to continue to be here. He's going to be ready for that opportunity whenever that opportunity comes. Like, he's getting some starts, and he's getting some opportunity, but it's not consistent as he probably wants it to be, right? Which, fine, there's a lot of guys that are talented. In the next three, four weeks, the guys that are getting the opportunities and continuing to, to produce in those opportunities are going to start playing every day. Yeah. Yep. And... I don't think that this team needs a one-man savior at all. Like, that's not, that's not where this team is at. I think Jake Brown could be a very key cog in this team, in this lineup, and a very important piece uh, as a lefty power athletic bat. Um, but is it in center field? Is it in right field? Is it in left field? I don't know. Now, he's obviously got you know run those balls out and do those things that – the little things that – listen, how you do anything is how you do everything. And everybody has been victim to that, where you have a, a mental lapse and you say, oh, I'm just out or whatever. You don't run hard. Everybody has been victim to that. I don't fault him. I, you know, he, he probably learned his lesson. He's going to come. And I don't even know if that's the reason he's talking about I'm just assuming. I'd imagine he, knowing him, talking to him, I'm sure he's you're not going to see – you're going to see him run down the line as hard as he can run down the line from here on out. Yeah. Um, but I do think he's going to be a big part of this lineup at some point this year. Yeah, I think he's a, a a key player that's going to have to have some level of like real production for him this year. But I'm with Mikey in a sense of I think Jay's not going to put it this way to the players if I had to guess. But this week in his mind is of extreme urgency to try to find wins however they come. I think after this weekend where he finds success over the next month is guys he's going to really try to stick with and let them yeah. roll. And try to see, can I find some some routine, some, some some consistency with this lineup by letting these guys go? Because that's where you're going to have to try to figure out, like, where is this team going to go? Where What is the identity of this team? How are they going to do it going forward? And there has to be some kind of consistency for you to be able to figure that out. All right. Next one up from Luke Bischoff. We've got a couple of more before we get to it. So I think there's two more that I want to that I want to answer, this being one of them. Ask him, what is your take on Jay Johnson's ejection? First one of at least his LSU career. Yeah. You don't see it happen in college very often. <laughs> right. Uh, I like it. I mean, I think at the time it was probably warranted. Kind of out of moves. Right. And like, hey, sometimes you get thrown out to try to like give the team a lift. Um, you know, I, I mean, I think I think it was it was a good time to do it or try it. I don't have one, a, a, you know, one way or the other. I'm kind of indifferent on it, but. Um, you know, if, if the umpire is going to warn both teams for the reason that they warned them, which is they're talking a little shit to each other and started getting chippy, and then the guy punches you out and then starts talking shit again, then, like, then what was the point of the warning? I understand, like, that was Jay's point. It's like, if you're going to warn us, one, I don't, in his mind, probably, I don't think you need to warn us, but if you're going to warn us, then have some substance behind the warning. And, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm all for it, you know, if, if he thought that was the move. Has that ever worked? For, have you ever been in a dugout where that's worked, where you're actually like, yeah. oh, hell yeah, Skipper's got our bag. Like, let's turn this thing up. Because it seemed like LSU went the other direction. Yeah, but it's usually it usually works when, like, um, there's, like, an isolated incident of, like, one person or something that, like, they felt they were really wronged. This one I felt like the umpire just warned the guys because he just wanted to make sure that everything was not going to get – he did, and you know, um, sometimes you get a little boost and just kind of gets because the guy's pissed off and they play better. Uh, so from the lens that I saw it from was so Bear hits the home or the bat before. I think they started chirping at him because he stood there and admired it and kind of watched it. For and Kyle Pierce just said the same thing. I'm like, he didn't even stay there that long. He, I thought he did what every hitter does. Yeah, these I've seen days. way worse. That right, right, like it wasn't that big of a deal to me. Um, the first baseman said something to him. He turned mm -hmm. back and said something. I saw he kept looking at um, Caglione as well as he was running home, or as he was running the, the bases. And then the catcher also said something to him when he crossed the plate. 
So I don't know how, how, how many other people saw this, but the next at bat, Travinsky comes up. Mm-hmm. If I remember correctly, the pitch before he struck out, I think Haglione quick pitched him. And he fouled that pitch off, and he looked at him, and you could see, I, don't, I couldn't tell if he said anything, but he was looking at him, and he got back in the box before the umpire even got back behind the plate. So I feel like he got quick pitched, and he said something about it, and then he K'd him on the next pitch, and that's when Caglione said something. Now, mind you, before he gave him up that at-bat is when Jay had the, was when the warnings came. So when that all happens and the first chirping comes from the pitcher, I think that's where Jay just flew off of because you just warned us. Right. And then now you let it, now you let it continue to go on. So I kind of felt like he was standing on that. And then that kind of snowballed into, well, also, this is a one-run ball game, yeah. I believe, at the time. And let's try to spark this thing. It just didn't work out that way. But I think he was really standing on no, it. No, it, it was a three-run ball. I don't know what it was. Anyway, uh, well, you know anyway either way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Either way. Yeah. Uh, Jay commented on after the game, and uh, he said that, you won't see me being ejected again this year, at least not with this team. And he also said he goes, "I feel like I was watching, my, like when he had to go back and watch the game in, I guess the, I guess the, the locker room or what have you, in the clubhouse. He was like, it was like watching my own funeral. It's like this is not how I never wanted to have to do this again. I was right. watching like right. my own death. Right. I mean, so, we, we we know how much like Jay Jay literally manages games. Like right. he is doing a ton. He is making a ton of foreshadowing a ton of moves before the moves actually happen he's not doing that just to spark it happened because he really saw something and i guess he was trying to stand on that but he's not one that's trying to especially with this team like you said that's trying to not be around to manage the game because that is what he does right all right last one here and i think it's just probably people that need to be addressed a couple of them christian burris and mr negative Sunshine pumping is crazy. This team is trash. Probably won't even make it to a regional. Arkansas is going to go three and zero against LSU and probably run rules twice. Man, if you feel that way, then why are you even watching? I'm sorry, dude. <laughs> yeah, they probably. You're right. They probably won't make a regional. Hate and love are this yeah. close. I mean, they probably won't make a regional. If look, if if you love to hate, that's a good thing. I am telling you that it's not as bad. You're gonna look up in in six weeks, and they could potentially be one or two in the SEC. I don't know if that's I, gonna happen, but. To say they are uh, trash, trash is uh, that's a little aggressive. I just I wonder what that Ole Miss fan base thought about them two years ago. Oh, they're calling for his head, for Bianca Mid-season to be fired. Firing. Yep. Just got to play it and, out, baby. Yeah. Now just got to play it out. Base, baseball is a beautiful sport because a, the season can change in one month, like. You could be average, 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 and all of a sudden you get this really good month and you get hot and you can ride that thing all the way. Washington Nationals did it in the big leagues a few years ago. Worst team in baseball, last place team in in May or June or whenever it was, ends up going on this outrageous run and winning the World Series. Ole Miss did it two years ago, right? You did it. Y'all are are stinky. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. If we want to talk about this team is trash, we were also let me let me just let me let me run this back for you right now. We were one month away well, let, from let, finishing. Before you get to that, let me let me talk about the guys on that team yeah. before you get to that. You, Lemay, was a freshman. We had the nation's home home run leader, or Matt second Clark. home run le- or second in home runs playing first base. Yep, Blake Dean. Blake Dean was on that team. Ryan Sean Ochinko, Ryan Schimpf, Micah Gibbs, Micah Gibbs, Lewis Coleman. Coleman was on that team. Um, Verdugo, Verdugo, who pitched the in the team. big leagues. Mm-hmm. Um, who else was in the outfit? Leon. Leon was on that team. Freshman All-American. So that trash team, this whole trash team you're talking about. a lot of teams about, that played professional yeah, baseball. Yeah, we were um, 11th in the SEC with exactly 12 teams at the time. 12 teams at the time. 11th out of 12. 12 teams. That's it. Right? With exactly one month left. One month. Perfect example. Right? That same... T- Trash ass team found a way to win 29, 29, 26 and one was their record. No, that was the year no, before. That was the year before. before. My bad. That was the year yeah, before. Yeah. But you were twenty three or twenty. It was it was a twenty three and seventeen or twenty three and sixteen or something. Whatever something. it was. Whatever something. it was. So that same trash team found itself in Omaha that year as well. So we're two weeks into this SEC schedule, man. I get it. It hadn't looked good. It got ten run rule two Sundays in a row. It's it's still early. It's still early, and I'm a, I'm gonna stand on that because I know what kind of talent is on the mound. I know what kind of talent that is still young and needs to come along as position players. 
That's what Jay and that coaching staff is here to do to make those guys come along and make them gel at the right time. This is baseball, man. If you're peaking right now, you might not be where you need to be at the end of the year. And I, I'm not saying you want to watch them get blown out on Sunday, but I damn sure don't want to see you peak right now either. And it's not saying that they are going to be elite at the end of the year. Right. But it's saying that they're the talent. They're, if they weren't talented and they weren't good, they didn't have the ability to do it, I would say uh, they, got, they got no shot. But they are talented, and they do have the ability to do it. And sometimes you just got to – it just doesn't happen right away sometimes. It's a whole new team. Coming off a of World Series, it's hard. We barely made the SEC tournament as a, as a, the next year after our World Series. Like, it it happens. So, it's not sunshine pump, pumping. This is more of, hey, this is the reality of baseball. But this team is super talented, and they have the ability to right the ship. That's all I got. Lloyd, you want one more? I'm sending the Zoom link again because we only we only we don't have the premium. We only have the starter package, uh, so it expires after a certain amount of time. Okay, so I'll do one more for you. Okay. Luke Bischoff, ask Mikey and Mitch, can we really can we realistically expect a significant improvement from the offense, or is a team average of between two fifty and three hundred where it's going to stay? I mean. I think you can expect a significant improvement. Now, 250 to 300 is a wide range there. If if I if I told you this team is – if I told a two, you this – 250 hitter or a 300 hitter? Yeah, I mean, I, if I told you this team was hitting 300 at the end of the year, I think you'd be happy with it. I mean, it's a, it's a it, I know it's an offensive league, but you have some really talented guys on the mound on a different team. So I do think it's going to get better. I do think that their average at the end of the year is going to be over 300. I'm willing to bet that. Like, I think it's going to be closer to between, like, the, like around the 310 range. I don't know where the average will be. I don't know how far the team, how far the team will fall, if you want to call it a fall. But if you are a um, regular watcher and or listener of the show, and I really appreciate it if you are, mm-hmm. I've only been pumping that since the start of this thing. They got some young dudes that's going to have to come on, and they're probably going to come on later in the year. So I expect it only to be better going forward. That's it. 